How many of y'all ready for God's word today? Come on, who's ready, who's ready, who's ready? You know, sometimes in life you can feel like you come to a dead end. Have you ever had that feeling? Like I've got no way forward, I can't see a way forward. And other times in life you feel like it's more than a dead end, like I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. Like I can't go forward, I also can't go backward. Like you feel like you're at the end of your rope and, and maybe you have nowhere to go. You've got nothing left. That's what I want to talk about today. I want to draw your attention to Psalm 109, verse 22. In the message translation, I love the way it reads. This is the words of David. And he said, I'm at the end of my rope. My life is in ruins. And I know that's some of you today, man, you feel like you're at the end of your rope. Like, man, I'm down to the end. I am stuck between a rock and a hard place. My marriage, PT, is at the end of its rope. My health is at the end of its rope. My family is at the end of its rope. Or maybe you just feel like the possibility of your healing and deliverance is just too far gone. I, I want to read to you Matthew chapter 5. And, uh, and this is great. These are the words of Jesus. This is also in the message translation because I like the way this one reads. But he says, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there's more of God and his rule. Come on, somebody. With less of you, there's more of God. I want you to look at somebody right now. Look at somebody in the face, right in the eyes. Somebody you came to church with, hopefully. Look at them and tell them this. With less of you, life is a blessing. <laughs> Y'all walked right into that trap. My life is more blessed with less of you. Because then there can be more of God. It's the same thing that John said. He said that I would decrease and that, Lord, you would increase. It's nothing against you. You're cool people. But Jesus is just that much cooler. And so I love this verse. David, you know, in Psalm 109, he says, I'm at the end of my rope and my life is in ruins. And then Jesus says, well, when you're at the end of your rope, listen, that's good news. You're blessed because I can do what only I can do. It's kind of like the old saying, when you're down to nothing, you know that God is up to something. Or the other saying that you never know that God is all you need until God is all you have. Have you ever been there in your own life? The truth is that you might be at the end of your rope, but there is always hope. There's always hope. And there are countless stories about hopeless people that discovered hope. By the way, that's what the whole Bible is about. Hopelessness turned into hope. The story of Mary and Martha that thought, man, I'm hopeless. Their brother Lazarus had died until Jesus raised him from the dead. Right? The story of the Israeli army fighting the Philistines with their champion fighter Goliath, this giant, looked hopeless until this teenage boy David came and took the giant down. Hopelessness turned into hope. Job, he felt hopeless. If you read the book of Job, man, I lost everything, everything. I have lost everything. All hope was gone until God blessed him back with double of everything that he ever had. But today I want to focus on this story in the book of Exodus, chapter 14, and it is the story of the Red Sea. And I want to look at this story because many of you today, you're at your own Red Sea. And so I want to dig into this because Moses and the Israelites, they found themselves at a dead end. They found themselves stuck between a rock and a hard place. And see, they had endured slavery for 400 years in Egypt. And eventually Moses was able to lead them to freedom out of Egypt but on their way out, Pharaoh and the Egyptian armies, they chased after them. And as they fled for their lives, they came to this dead end called the Red Sea. There's no way forward. That's all water. There's no way backward. That's their army coming after us. They're stuck between a rock 
in a hard place. They're at the end of their rope. Now, I just want to say this to you today. If you feel like your only hope is God, I want you to know that you're in good hands because God always does God type stuff. God always does God type stuff. In Psalm 77, verse 19, David is looking back 500 years and look what he says. He says, your road led through the sea, your pathway through the mighty waters, a pathway no one knew was there. That's what I decided my sermon title was today, a pathway that no one knows was there. Because somebody today, you need to hear this, that you might be at your dead end, but I believe for you that God has a pathway that nobody knows is there. Somebody needs to hear it. Listen, I'm believing for your life that God's got a pathway. God's got your answer. God's got your miracle. This is the God that we serve. This is the God that we serve. By the way, he's a God who makes a way out of absolutely no way. He's a God who makes a road through the rivers. He's a God that puts broken pieces back together. He's a God who brings healing to the hurting. He's a God who brings the dead back to life. He's a God who gives new life and new hope and new love and new hearts. This is the God that we serve. And I got to stay on track because my band's trying to get me going somewhere I don't want to go right now. I'm just trying to talk, but they're getting me shouting. I have severe ADHD, which makes this church miraculous that any one note, any one sound, any one thing I see can send me off into the weeds and y'all still come back. That's miraculous. That's miraculous. I haven't been here in three weekends. It's the longest three weekends I've ever gone without preaching. So I just want to warn you today that I've got three sermons in me. Church will be over at 3 p.m., I got to preach. I got to preach. The Bible says it's like a fire shut up in my bones. I have to, I have to say something. I got to say, I got to preach. I got to preach. And uh, I want to read Isaiah 43 because the prophet Isaiah, he said this. He said, this is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea and a pathway through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there, listen to this, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Somebody say, forget about it. Forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Man, have you ever thought about this, that maybe, just maybe, just perhaps, maybe that that trap that you thought was set for you is actually for your enemies? He made a way where there was no way, and when they got through on dry land, they were never going to face that same giant ever again. He makes a way. But I want to talk to you for a few minutes in your outline about what to do when you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. What do you do when you're at the end of your rope? Before I do, I'm going to pray. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we thank you for your word today. We pray that, Lord, that you would speak your word to us, that it would penetrate into the depths of our soul, that seeds would be planted, that seeds would be watered today, God, that you would give hope, you would give new life, you would bring healing and restoration. God, you are our daily bread. Today, we want to consume the word of God so that it consumes us. We pray this in Jesus' name. We all say amen, amen, amen. Let's give a round of applause to our music team who's always... Some churches have a band, but these guys are family, and I love you guys. 
and I got, I, I got so much love for you guys because what you don't know is they're not only the most talented band for sure in the state of Arizona, but they are like the nicest people you've ever been around, and they love Jesus with all their heart. So appreciate you guys, man. So, and I, I, I love Chris a little bit more because he has a Phoenix Suns hat and, and Kelvin like a Lakers. He's a Laker fan, but he does root for the Suns if, if Braun gets smoked, which he did this year. But, and then Monty, Arizona native with me. We are Phoenix Suns guys right here. But uh, I, I just think, man, you know what? There's, there's so much power in authentic worship. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're not here to put on a show for you. We're here to sing to Jesus Christ. We're here to sing to him and to worship him. I, I want to give you a few points today. If you're taking notes, what do you do when you're stuck between a rock and a hard place? Number one, easier said than it is done. Number one is keep your faith. Keep your faith. Say that out loud. Keep your faith. Look at somebody and tell them, faith it until you make it. Come on. Keep your faith. Keep your faith. No matter how scary life looks in front of you, I have got to keep my faith. This is why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, he said, for I walk by faith and not by sight. I walk by faith, not by what I see, but by what I know God is going to do. I walk by faith and not by sight. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to keep walking by faith and not by sight. Even if I have to walk with a limp. Even, hey, Jacob wrestled with God. I'm not letting go until I receive your blessing. I'm not letting go until you bless me. What did God do? He broke his hip. How you like that for a blessing? And the Bible says he walked with a limp for the rest of his life. You know what that limp represented? An encounter with God. That limp, every time somebody said, yo, what happened to you? I had an encounter with God. What happened to you? I've got a story to tell. Anybody else got a limp in your life? But it's a story that you can tell every time somebody asks you, yo, what's going on with that? That is a story about God's glory. So some of us, we walk in with a limp. I prefer to think of it as I walk by faith with a gangster limp. You know what I'm saying? Like spiritual gangster I got to keep my faith keep my faith see faith is what fuels your hope faith is what feeds your hope it fuels it it feeds it in in Hebrews chapter 11 there is a chapter about faith the entire chapter is about men and women of faith. We call it the hall of faith, almost like a hall of fame, but it's a hall of faith. It's champions of the faith that are listed in Hebrews 11, and it tells us why they're listed as people of faith. But Hebrews 11, 1, the first verse is what I want to look at for just a second. It says this about faith. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, it is the evidence of things not seen. Let's read this together out loud. Ready? Here we go. Now, faith is the, out loud means your external voice. All right, let's read it out loud. Here we go. Now, faith, it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I love this verse. This verse is absolute fire. It's saying, faith is substance. It's substance. I can't see it, but I believe it. I can't see it, but it's evident. I can't see it, but it's obvious that God is going to do it. I believe it. I believe it. That's what my faith does. Now listen and pay attention. Your faith is so important to your life that it is the number one thing that the devil targets is your faith. It is the number one thing because if the devil can target your faith, if the devil can make you doubt, the devil can definitely take you out. If he can get you doubting, he can get you discouraged. You have to keep 
your faith. The faith is a fight. Man, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you're at the end, man. You got nowhere to go. And you start questioning your faith. And you start questioning, man, I don't know if God can do this. I'm not sure if God can do this. I'm starting to wonder, like, can God do this? I believe that God could do anything until this very moment in my life. And now I'm starting to think, like, I don't know if God can do this. I don't know if God will do this. And that's why the devil targets your faith. The enemy, he wants you to doubt. He wants you to be discouraged. He wants you to be deflated. He ultimately wants you to be be defeated so he attacks our faith and we're human and humans do human stuff humans sometimes doubt their beliefs and believe their doubts that's why the devil targets it that's why he attacks our faith but that's also the importance of the word of God I want to read to you from Ephesians 6 And we know this chapter because it talks about the armor of God. We have to have armor, the armor of God in our lives to keep the faith. Let's read, starting in verse 10 in Ephesians 6, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against what? The devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against what? Flesh and blood, it's not against each other. Y'all have heard me preach the paint off the wall on this one. My, my fight is not against you. I don't care what the media tells you. The fight is not black versus white. I don't care what the media tells you. The fight isn't left versus right. I don't care what the media tries to tell you. There is a spiritual war going on that you and I cannot see. And the devil wants to make you think that we're against each other. But we're not against each other. We're on the same team. We're all brothers and sisters in the Lord. And we fight together against the real enemy. And that is hell and his demons. And that is called spiritual warfare. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So that when the day of the evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth. Here's the armor. The belt of truth buckled around your waist. Be a person of integrity. Be a person that tells the truth. Be a person that builds your life on the truth. The Bible says that Jesus is the way and the truth and the That's what he is. He's the truth. Jesus is the real deal. So I have the belt of truth buckled around my waist, the breastplate of righteousness. My feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, verse 16. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It's four little golf claps for the word of God. That's fine. It's fine. <laughs> this is so important. I mean, critical to the man or woman of God. Absolutely critical. Do you know that God's word calls you a soldier? It calls you a soldier and you are a soldier for Christ. He says, go into battle already with your armor on (laughs) in advance, not once the battle happens. You know what I'm saying? If I'm playing football, how many of you grew up playing football? Let me see your hands. You played some football. You put a helmet on. You put the shoulder pads. Uh, I was a quarterback, so I was basically wrapped in toilet paper. And I was just, I had rib cage protector, tailbone, hip bones. I had thigh pads, knee pads, shin guards. You have the armor of the football athlete. 
I didn't go into the game, start the first quarter, and go, you know what? I need to go get my pads on. <laughs> you come ready. But see, what I'm saying is a lot of people, they know about the armor of God, but they don't go put it on until the battle's already begun. I know I should be in the word of God, but I don't even pick that thing up and dust it off until the hell is already striking at me. And God is saying, you need to come ready in advance with the armor of God. But I want to look at one verse for a second. Verse 16, in addition to this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take up the shield of faith. Take up the shield of faith. What does this mean? It means that your faith, your faith is your shield. He mentioned a lot of different concepts, truth, righteousness, your feet, ready. Your faith is your shield. And that is exactly why the devil targets your faith. Because if the devil can take out your shield, then your protection is God. He wants to break down your faith and your hope and your belief that God is truly able to do the impossible. But we know that that is a lie from the pit of hell. And we know that God is the God of the impossible. We know that with God, all things are possible so we can keep the faith now listen I got good news about faith you don't have to have a lot of faith you just have to have a little faith just a little just a drop of faith just a drip just a drop just something small just tiny faith just tiny. Jesus said you just need the faith of a mustard seed to move a mountain but we get this all twisted in our heads and we think i gotta have the faith of a mountain to move a mustard seed but jesus said you just need the faith of a mustard that's a little tiny drop of faith mustard seed faith be honest how many have ever actually put your eyes on a mustard seed raise your hand okay okay put your hands down if you've ever never seen a mustard seed it's okay raise your hand you have no idea what a must okay those of you that don't know do you know what a marijuana seed looks like? Anybody? 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 Anybody else? Oh, marijuana? Who knows? Be honest. You've seen a marijuana seed. Raise your hand. How many have smoked a marijuana seed? Come on. Raise your hand. This is the seriously messed up service. Nobody raised their hand in the 9 a.m. About half of you are like, yep. Smoked one of those this morning. You guys need help. You know that. That's why you're here. That's why you're here. That's why you're here. You don't need a lot of faith. It's just a little bit of faith. And I've got more good news about faith is that you can grow. You can grow. You can increase your faith. The Bible even tells us how. Isn't that great news? The Bible says in Romans that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So if you want more faith, you need more word. If I want my faith to grow, then I need my time in God's word to grow. Some of you, some of you, probably the 9 a.m. service, some of you, the only word you get is right here every Sunday morning. And you wonder why you're hopeless and your faith is depleted. He says faith comes by hearing, hearing and by hearing the word of God. Let's look at number two. The second thing, if you're feeling like you're at the end of your rope today, number two is do not fear. Do not fear. Do not fear. Fear. See, this is what the devil does is he not only attacks your faith, but he attacks you with fear at the exact same time. He knows that fear will paralyze you. He knows that fear will make you panic. He knows that fear will steal your peace. He knows that fear could steal your purpose. So he attacks us with fear. He attacks us with fear. 
do not fear. I love the story of Moses because Moses had fears. I think it's interesting that Moses was in a situation where he had to keep his faith in the face of fear. He had to keep his faith in the face of fear. Do you know that the one place, the one thing that Moses feared the most was the same thing that God made him go face? Pharaoh. You remember 40 years before Moses was called? 40 years before that, the Bible says that Moses killed an Egyptian. And because he killed an Egyptian, he was terrified of the leader of Egypt, Pharaoh. So what did he do because he was in fear? Moses went out and lived in the wilderness for 40 years. He hid for 40 years because he was afraid. That's what fear does. It makes you run. It makes you hide. And all of a sudden, Exodus chapter 3, this bush catches on fire. And God starts speaking to Moses, Moses, take off your sandals. Take off your Jordans. You're standing on holy ground. And this is when God calls him to go back to Egypt and Pharaoh and lead God's people out of Egyptian bondage. The very thing that he feared the most was the very thing that God called him to face. Do you know that God does the same thing with you? Isn't that good news? Like, the very thing you fear the most is the very thing God will make you face. But I've learned that courage, confidence in Christ will take you places you had no idea you could go. I have learned in my own life, because I used to think, man, you just got, you cannot be afraid. You're a man of God. You can never be afraid. You're going to be afraid. Because fear is a natural instinct and emotion. You say, well, PT, the Bible says, don't, you know, God did not give a spirit of fear. And the word does say God does not give us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. But a spirit of fear and being afraid every now and then is a radically different concept. Because a spirit of fear means your entire life is controlled by fear. But I have moments when I'm afraid. But I've learned that courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the answer to fear. And that when I walk by faith and not by sight, God fills me with supernatural courage because I'm focused on the right things and not the wrong things because I'm focused on the power of God and not the possibilities of my giant. And so he makes Moses face his fear. You know, I was thinking that it's interesting because I don't know about you, but I always prefer the easy way through. You know what I'm saying? Like, can anybody feel that with me? Like, I'm at the Red Sea, Lord. If at all possible, you could just kind of pick me up and take me over. But I've also learned that God's way through is almost never the easy way through. It's almost never the easy way through. But I want the easy way through. I say, God, give me a map and show me the easiest, quickest, least fearful route in this scenario. And then God gives you a map and it takes you through the very place you didn't want to go. God, I want a better marriage. God gives you a map and it goes right through the admit that you're the problem. Right? God, God, I need a map. I need, I need you to restore my family. I haven't spoken to a family member in however many years. God, that you would bring us back together. And God gives you a map and it goes right through the humble yourself and call them. 
God, I, I want to be free from this addiction. Would you set me free from this addiction? I'm so tired of living this way. God, would you set me free from this addiction? And he gives you a map that goes right through the you need to step out and be vulnerable and you need to come clean and you need to tell somebody about your struggle. When God gave Moses a map, I don't know if I, how do I go? I can't go through that. I can't go that way. I can't go that way. God gives Moses a map and God's directions to the promised land took him to the one place that he never wanted to go through, Pharaoh. It's interesting because in verse 13 of Exodus 14, (laughs) I think this is interesting because it says that Moses told the people, don't be afraid. But he was afraid. You know, you can tell somebody not to be afraid and still be afraid. I do it with my kids all the time. You're in a terrifying moment and they're like, Dad, I'm freaking out inside, but I don't let them see it. We're good. And inside you're like, God, are we good? We're good, right? We're going to be good? And he says, don't be afraid. Listen, I love this. I love that this is so good. Don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians that you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. I don't know what situation you're in today, and I don't know what situation seems hopeless in your life today, but God directly told me to tell you that the Lord is fighting for you, and he is going to rescue you. You only need to be still. Number three, when your faith and your fears are under attack, well, what do I do then? You focus on God's promises. I want to read to you two different psalms real quick. I want to read to you Psalm 119 in verse 50. And then I'm going to read to you Psalm 116 in verse 8. Psalm 119 verse 50, it says, My comfort in my suffering is this, that your promise preserves my life. Your promise, God, preserves my life. So when I'm full of fear, when I'm depleted in my faith I am going to focus on the promises of God because my comfort in my suffering is that God's promise preserves my life the second song I will keep my eyes always on the Lord with him at my right hand I will not be shaken so I keep my focus on God's promise and not my problem I keep My focus on the power of God and not the possibilities of my problem. I'll say that one again. I keep my focus on the power of my God and not on the possibilities of my problem. And I focus on those promises and I claim those promises for my marriage and for my family and for my children and for my calling and for my church family and for my sanity and for my emotions and my stability. What are God's promises? You ever thought about that? What are God's promises? God's promises are scriptures written inside the word of God that were written for our lives. They're promises. How, how, how would you know if I, said, if I said, you know, hey, I got a promise for you. Sam, I want to tell you a promise. You're like, PT, I'm ready for a promise. So I'm going to tell you a promise. And Sam's like, okay, because, man, I need a promise. I said, you know what, though? I just need you to call me on Sunday at 10. I'm going to tell you the promise. But then Sam don't call me at 10. I have a promise for him. I might, I might have a problem. I say, you know what? My promise might be I'm going to give Sam $10 million. And, but Sam didn't show up at 10 and asked me. And then the next Sunday, Sam didn't show up at 10 either and asked me. But he knows in there, there's a promise in there. You see, that's what we do with God's word. We know it's full of promises, but you never put your face in it. You never read his promises. You never search for his promises. You know there's promises in there. In fact, there's over 7,000 promises 
in the Bible for our lives. That's a lot of promises. Let me ask this question. If there are 7,000 promises in the Bible for your life, how many of those promises do you actually know? How many have you ever read? They're promises. And what I like to do is I like to read a scripture and I grab a hold of that scripture and I will memorize that scripture and I will recite that scripture and I will pray that scripture and I will bombard heaven with that scripture and I will preach that scripture and I will sing that scripture. Hey, hey, let me, let me say this. We, we just saying, come to me. Anybody like that song? Come to me. That song right there, we're going to release it. We have actually a Hollywood producer that produces Justin Bieber stuff. His name is Pooh Bear. He's also an artist. Pooh Bear committed to me to produce our first worship album. Do you know that, that this guy... This guy, Pooh Bear, I met him through a friend, and now we're friends, and, like, he followed me on Instagram. We're boys, you know what I'm saying? And so, so like, Pooh Bear, he said, he, he's been, he's won, like, so many Grammys. It's, he, like, I asked, I said, how many times have you ever been to the Grammys? He's like, I can't, I don't even remember, PT. And he's like, this is what I want to do for you. I have never done a worship album. It's the one thing I've always wanted to do. I've done about every other genre. I've never done a worship album, and this is what I want to do. He said, I'm going to do this for the Lord for free. And I'm going to do this album for you guys. Anyway, I got, off, I got off out in the boonies. What I was trying to tell you is that Come to Me song is a scripture. Amelia and Daniel and I wrote that in my office from one scripture. So I cling a hold to these promises, man. I claim these promises for my life. I mean, I claim them. I focus on the promises of God. This is what the Bible says in Joshua 1.8. God told Joshua, he said, Joshua, keep this book of law, the Bible, the scriptures, my word. Keep this book of law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night. In other words, Focus on God's word, focus on his promises so that it, you may be careful to do everything written in it, then you will be prosperous and successful. So I meditate on his word day and night. I get his word into my heart day and night. I get his word into my heart so that it comes out of my mouth day and night. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. He says these commandments, the Bible, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Listen, Focus, focus, I preach this so often. Focus is a powerful spiritual weapon. Focus. The more focused you are, the more powerful you are. The more focused on God you are, the more powerful as a child of God you are. In fact, last Tuesday, which seems like a year ago, last Tuesday night for the Phoenix Suns Chapel, I talked to our team about focus. We were tied two to two. We won two in a row. We lost two in a row. And I decided that God decided to tell me that I need to talk to these guys about focus. And I talked about the power of focus. And I talked about the importance of focus, spiritual focus, mental focus, emotional focus, physical focus. It's easy to get distracted, especially when there is enormous amounts of pressure. It's easy to get focused on the wrong things. It's easy to get focused, listen, on our mistakes, on missed shots. It's easy for our focus as players, and I'm listening to the fans talk trash to me. It's easy to get focused on the crowd chanting curse words. It's easy to get focused on the referees making the worst calls in the history of sports against the Phoenix Suns. It's easy to get distracted. And listen, it's easy to get distracted from the bigger picture. And the bigger picture for our Phoenix Suns is they want to win the whole thing. 
They want to win the whole thing. We want to win it all for the men of God on the sons. It's also about bringing honor and glory to God through their ability and through their gift. We got to keep our focus and not get distracted. See, focusing on the negative, it destroys your confidence. Focusing on distractions, it destroys your goals. So I just basically preached to you what I preached to them. And I talked about how Peter was in the boat and Jesus comes walking on water. It is about 3 or 4 a.m. And the disciples, they're afraid because, I mean, you would be too. Some dude walking towards you on the water. And Peter goes, Jesus, is that you? And Jesus said, Peter, it's me. And Peter says, I'll know, Jesus, if that's really you. Tell me to come to you. And Jesus says one word, one word. He says, come. Peter gets out the boat. Can you imagine this moment? Have you ever tried to walk on water? Raise your hand, be honest. Come on, you've tried? I've tried. (laughs) And he's walking on water. Really, he's not even walking on water. He's walking on the word. Jesus could have said anything. He could have said fly. He could have said, you know, do a back flip or whatever. He could have said, it's his word. I'm walking on his word. I'm walking on his word. I'm walking on his word. Word, it is my rock and my foundation. It is my every one word from God can change your life forever. One word from God can change your situation to a miraculous situation. One word. And then he starts to look at the distractions. It's like this is fun until it wasn't. I'm walking on water. Till I wasn't. And he starts looking at the waves and he starts thinking about the wind. And all of a sudden you start thinking, my God, I'm going to die. I'm in the middle of the water. And he starts to sink. What's your focus? Is it on the word or is it on the wind? Is it on the word or is it on the waves? Are you focused on Jesus and his power Or are you focused on the giant and the possibilities? And he starts to sink, cries out to Jesus, and Jesus saves him. And he's like, yo, man, why'd you have such little faith? That was my chapel. You ever preached to somebody? Well, probably you haven't. But if you ever have and you're not sure, they're picking up what you're laying down. And... You know, later on, we won that game by a lot. And much to my surprise, Coach Monty talked about Chapel in the post-game interview. I have a clip that I want to show you. Does it look more like a team that you coached all year? What would you like about how they play tonight? Um, Pastor Crab in Chapel just today was talking about focus. And uh, that was something we were had an abundance tonight. We had a great deal of focus on the game plan. It's my God has a funny way of encouraging you. Focus. And the reality is that there are going to be distractions in life. The reality is you're going to make some mistakes in life. You're going to miss some shots in life. You're going to get some bad calls in life, some unfair things that get thrown your way. You're going to get heckled and harassed by the enemy in your life. That is why you must keep your faith. That is why you must not fear. That is why you must stay focused and ignore the distractions. Ignore the distractions. This is one thing I have personally learned learned in my own life about distractions is that distractions are distractions because they entice you. 
And what a distraction does is little by little, it takes you off track. You know, I'm on this straight line to Jesus, baby. I'm on this straight line. I, I, gotta, I gotta do something here. I'm gonna turn this light because the Bible says that Jesus is the light. So, can so, I don't know how these things work. I just preach here. Ryan, come here. Sorry. Hold this down. Hurry. Show us your athletic abilities. No, no, not that far. Just point it at me, okay? So there you go. Just not like up and down. Just like. There you go. There you go. Oh, yeah. So, so, so I'm walking towards the light. Right? And the Bible says you can't see the face of God, you would die. So this is kind of a good illustration. So I'm walking towards this light. And this is, this is what happens. This is what happens. Lexus, stay there. Lexus just walked by. And she's a distraction. No, 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 that's still on me. And so I was walking towards the light. And then Lexi, who works for me, and I've known her since she was four. And I coached her in basketball. Yes. She walks by. And now I'm distracted. And I said, what is she doing? And I start walking the wrong way. Right? So you can go, Lex, thanks. And so you have these, you have these distractions. And this is, what, this is what else I've learned about distractions. They inch you away, inch by inch, until you're in the middle of the wilderness. And you have no idea how you got there. It's just inch by inch, inch by inch. I'm distracted. You can point that thing away now. Thank you. Now I'm seeing green and thanks, Ryan. It's the best thing you've ever did for Jesus right there. It's crazy. It's crazy. I have lived this out so many times. The distraction starts as an enticement. It doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal. And the devil has a funny way. The Bible says he masquerades himself like an angel of light. So even though I'm following the light, this kind of looks like light too. And I just take an inch away and an inch away because he knows he can't just throw you off the track. You would never do that in your heart. It's the distractions. I don't need to go to church today. I'm gonna do some housework. I'll catch it online. Then three weeks later, you know your homie asked you to go golfing. And you would rather go put yourself through torture. <laughs> hacking around a dimpled ball with a crooked stick. <laughs> then go to church. A couple weeks later, your homies have barbecues. None of the white people are invited. <laughs> it's like, you know, when we throw a barbecue, we're going to watch PT on, online. Pretty soon, you inch away. This is some of you today because this is your first time back in church for a long time. And I, I just want to say welcome back. But this is how it works. The devil just slowly distracts you, inches you away. And little by little over time, you end up in the wilderness. Focus is important. Jesus said these words in Luke 9, 62. He said, anyone who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. I haven't even done number four yet, have I? Number four. When you're at the end of your rope, this is a big one. Let go. seems crazy counterintuitive let go because when you let go that's when you let God and, and I got news for you I don't know if you've ever hung at the end of a rope but I have I gotta say it sounded weird if you ever hung from a rope with your hands at the end of a rope I got news for you, you have no other option than to let go. 
So I let go. And I let God. And it's like this story of this man that I heard when I was younger in my faith. He's walking near a cliff. And he's looking down like that is crazy how far down that is. He takes another step and he loses his foundation and he slips and he falls and he starts to panic as he's flailing and he's falling. Somehow miraculously he hits the side of the cliff and then hits another thing and another thing and he ends up on this little ledge of this cliff. But as he looks up, there's no way he could climb back up the height he fell. There's no way down unless you drop to your death. And so in desperation, he cries out, God, will you please save me? And God says, yes, let go. Let go. Let go of your burdens and lay them at the feet of Jesus. Release your heavy burdens and lay them at the feet of Jesus. I give it to God. I let go and I let God because you know what? God cares more about your situation than you do. God cares more about your relationship than you do. God cares more about your child than you do. God cares about your mental health more than you do. My son Josiah's favorite verse Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. See, God has a pathway for you that nobody knows about. Exodus 14, 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and all that night, Listen, listen. All that night, the Lord drove the sea back with the strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and their left. They took the next step and God took it from there. See, I've learned this about my own life as well is that most of the time, God's miracle isn't getting you out of the situation. It's getting you through the situation. I mean, even Jesus didn't get out of the cross. I let go. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we thank you for your word today and we thank you that we're here because we want to focus on the promises that are inside of your word. Promises that you've given us. Promises like you will never leave us or forsake us. Promises like you're a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Promises like I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Promises like no weapon formed against me shall prosper promises like if God is for me then who can be against me God today we cling to your promises and we trust you with today and we trust you with tomorrow we trust in the Lord with all of our hearts God we lean not we lean not we lean not on our own understanding. In all of our ways, we acknowledge you. God, and we know that you will direct our paths. God, give us the map and let us be faithful to follow that map no matter where it leads. One step of faith at a time. God, for we walk by faith and not by sight. I know that some of you are here today and you've never taken a step of faith in your life to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And if that's you, I'm so glad that you were here for this message because God wants a relationship 
with you. The Bible says it. God loved you so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Today, God, we believe. Today, God, we take the step of faith. And we say, Jesus, we believe. I give you my life today. If you're here today and you want to pray that prayer, you want to become a Christian right now. I want you to pray. Jesus, I'm yours. I'm all in. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for rising again for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for unconditional love. God, we love you. We love you so much. I pray your blessing and anointing and your favor on every person listening to this word today. God, flood them with your favor. Flood their lives with your mercy. Flood their lives with your promises. Flood their lives with your grace. God, that you would bless us, but more importantly, that we would bless you. We love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. We all say amen. amen. Come on, let's give Jesus a round of applause today. Would you stand to your feet, Impact Church? God bless you guys. I look forward to seeing you next weekend.